Hi everyone and welcome to Breaking Brains Solving Problems, lessons learned from two years of setting puzzles and riddles for InfoSec professionals. So to introduce myself, my name is Matt Wixey, I lead cybersecurity research for PwC UK's cybersecurity practice. I also am a part-time PhD student at University College London. Prior to joining PwC, I worked in law enforcement in the UK doing cyber R&D and I am a puzzle addict, which is what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Before we get started, if you go to thedarkartlab.com slash crossword20, you'll find a security-themed cryptic crossword. And whoever sends me the most correct answers for that crossword by the 13th of August at 1300 hours uh, will win a prize. It's not gonna be a big prize, I'll tell you in advance, but you will get a prize and some kudos as well. Uh, do feel free to make a start during the talk if you find your mind wandering a little bit, as we'll see that can be a good approach to problem solving. So in this talk, we're gonna look at some processes underpinning problem solving, uh, the roles of expertise and bias in those processes and in problem solving generally, some strategies for improvement, problem solving as applied to InfoSec specifically, the puzzle program that I run at PwC, and then some tips and resources for creating your own puzzle program in your organization as well. So how problem solving works? Really, all higher level cognition is problem solving to some extent. You have some desired end state that you want to get to, and in order to get to that end state, you have to solve problems. They may be fairly simple, or they may be very complex. And really, problem solving is any activation of concepts in the brain to access further concepts. In terms of the brain itself, there are a number of regions associated with problem solving, uh, mostly the prefrontal cortex, but um, other areas as well. And there are specific regions of the brain which activate uh, when problem solving is complete, that kind of aha moment when you uh, get the solution. And we know that when people try to solve problems, there is some form of abstract representation. There's the creation of mental structures in the mind, but the exact mechanisms behind that are not clear. It's a bit of a mystery. When it comes to problem solving, particularly with what are called knowledge lean problems, which is where you don't need information outside of the puzzle uh, pretext, the puzzle stimulus itself, uh, there are two steps, understanding and searching. Understanding involves assimilating the stimulus of a puzzle. So understanding what it is you're being asked to do and how that's presented, and then forming mental structures to represent that problem. And that can involve a variety of perceptual processes depending on the media in which the puzzle is presented. And then there's searching. So searching is actually finding or calculating a solution um, following that understanding phase. And, and the process of problem solving is usually a blend of those two things, and it may be a kind of circular process. So it's not necessarily uh, linear. It may go back and forth between those two phases. So when solving a problem, there is first a definition of a problem space. And that's the diagram you see here on the top right. An initial problem state is defined you have various operators which can change the state and they may be explicitly given or there may be things that you have to uh, deduce or induce. And then you test if uh, the new state, once you've applied those operators, resembles or is the desired solution, the desired end state. And there are various strategies you can use when problem solving. I've put some of them here, there are others, uh, but these tend to be the most common or the most well known. Proceed strategies, which is simply a, a linear process, choosing an operator, testing if it affects a state and whether that's a solution, and then repeating. Backward chaining, where you start at the solution, if it's known, and try and work out how to get to that end state. Subgoaling, this is where you choose an operator, you try and make it fit. If it doesn't fit, you try and make it fit. Um, so that becomes a sub goal to the, uh, the end goal of getting to that end state. So an example of that applied to security would be if you're a pen tester testing a web app, um, you might want to try uh, SQL queries or cross-site scripting, and there might be a web application firewall that prevents you from running those types of queries. So your sub goal would be to try and bypass the WAF in order to get your queries to the web app and then further exploit it. Means end analysis is simply 
uh, working out what the difference is currently between your present state and the end goal and then trying to reduce that difference. And then finally, um, and probably most interestingly, I think, is insight. And insight results in a change in the problem space itself. So to give you an example from the world of riddles and puzzles, um, you're probably familiar with the, the riddle of uh, the boat and the river. So you have a number of items, uh, a bag of corn, a chicken and a fox, and you have to get them over to the other side of a river in a boat. But you can only take one item across at a time. And if you leave the corn with the chicken, the chicken eats the corn. If you leave the chicken with the fox, the fox eats the chicken. So insight with that particular riddle is the realization that as well as taking things from riverbank A to riverbank B, you can also take them back in the opposite direction. And that's what opens up a solution in that case. In terms of testing, testing and measuring problem solving ability. So problem solving ability is often, uh, it's considered a, an innate skill. Um, it's something which you either have or you don't, you can't teach it. And the research suggests that actually that isn't true, that everyone can get better at problem solving, everyone has the ability to problem solve and to improve. And there are various ways you can measure someone's problem solving ability. You can measure it by the time it takes them to solve certain problems, um, probably most compellingly their approach to problem solving, but also their comfort level with ambiguity, um, with uncertain situations, with unpredictability and that sort of thing. And there are various specific tests that researchers have come up with for perhaps testing out uh, how good someone is at problem solving, a survey of statements, uh, testing people's tolerance for ambiguity, and embedded figures tests, which may give you an indication of someone's ability to deal with unstructured tasks. The role of expertise in problem solving is an interesting one, especially uh, in security. So experts tend to know a larger variety of what are called problem schemas. A schema is uh, a categorization of a problem. It's, it's saying, oh, this is one of those types of problems. And the evidence suggests that particularly with experts, the triggering process for those schemas happens earlier than it does for non-experts. That can lead to problems. It can lead um, people to make assumptions. And with some problems, um, those assumptions can be quite dangerous. And particularly, again, in the world of puzzles and riddles, authors of puzzles will often play on those assumptions in order to try and trick you. So if you take um, the knights and knaves type puzzle, for example, um, you may have come across this before. This is where knights always tell the truth, knaves always lie, and you have to try and work out information by asking one of them or both of them a question. And typically those sorts of problems, there are lots of problems within that kind of uh, that category. But those sorts of problems tend to have one approach. And if you kind of read the setup to a puzzle and you assume, oh, it's going to be one of those types of puzzles, that can lead you down a path of assumptions, which may make it much harder to, to actually solve the puzzle. Some evidence suggests that expertise might not play a huge role in some problems or some areas of problem solving. So there was a study uh, some time ago where undergraduates and mathematicians were given algebra problems. And you would expect that the experts, the mathematicians, would look at a problem and say, oh, it's one of these types of problems and then solve it. But actually that didn't happen. What happened was um, that the, the experts took about as much time to solve the problems as the novices, as the undergraduates, but they made fewer mistakes. That was kind of the key differential. Um, there. Some other things that experts tend to do as opposed to novices is they tend to sort problems into categories based on solutions, whereas novices tend to sort them based on the problem itself. Experts, uh, as I mentioned, may perform faster. It may be something to do with what's called memory chunking, um, which is uh, essentially kind of being able to make certain deductive leaps based on um, putting kind of chunks of memory and chunks of experience together. But as I said, experts often don't perform faster. Um, the key difference might be that they just make fewer mistakes. Experts also tend to be better at self-monitoring, so working out where they're going wrong, and also estimating the difficulty at the start of the process, which is obviously very important, particularly as you can imagine in security as well. Now, there are a number of uh, biases which are um, 
particularly applicable to problem solving. I've put six here, but there, there are likely many more. Um, so experience bias is something you see quite a lot with decision makers, with management, and it's relying on past experience to make decisions. Again, similar to that kind of triggering process of schemas to say, oh, we've had a similar situation before, that's how we dealt with it then, this is how we're gonna deal with it now. And whilst that can be useful, it can also lead to assumptions, it can lead to uh, making the wrong decision um, and not recognizing that the current situation is different from previous situations. Self-serving bias is um, almost a kind of ego related one. So this is the, the belief that we're making logical and rational decisions, even if we're not necessarily. Hindsight bias is putting higher probabilities on known outcomes. Uh, anchoring is a particularly important one. So anchoring is the process of avoiding what's called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance, uh, there's been a lot of research written about it. Um, it's essentially the kind of gap between reality and our beliefs and understanding that that gap exists. And we kind of, as a species, will go a long way to, um, to avoid cognitive dissonance. And that's particularly the case with, uh, with problem solving. Confirmation bias, I'm sure many people have heard of, that's kind of prioritizing evidence that reinforces our beliefs and not prioritizing or placing lesser importance on evidence that challenges our beliefs. And then finally, the sunk cost fallacy. So this isn't so much a bias, um, but it is a, a kind of logical fallacy. And it's a, an interesting example. And you may kind of have come across examples of this um, in your professional experience. The sunk cost fallacy, uh, an example that's commonly given is if you work for a company that's building a new type of plane and this plane is um, it's doing something that's never been done before, whatever that is, it's some sort of uh, innovation. Um, and you've spent 90% of your budget, um, you're about two weeks away from launching this plane, uh, not, not literally, but you're about two weeks away from actually putting it on the market and selling it to someone. And then you hear that your competitor has used exactly the same innovation, but in a much more efficient way. They're gonna sell their plane for cheaper, it works better, it's safer, it's more reliable, and they're gonna release it in a week's time. So the sunk cost fallacy is kind of saying, oh, well, we've come this far, we're gonna spend the remaining 10% of our budget and we're gonna work the next two weeks to, to launch our plane anyway, even though we know that there's a, you know, a, a far better product that's gonna be on the market before that. And it's about kind of weighing up in the long run what is actually gonna cost you more. So improvement strategies generally for problem solving, um, the first is just to do more. So like any cognitive skill or really any motor skill, uh, the more you do, the better you get at it. And the more you do, you'll find that some of these uh, strategies will kind of come into place almost automatically. So compounding, for example, this is putting one or more operators together, enabling you to make deductive leaps. That's not something you think about consciously, it's something that just happened. Some things you do need to think about consciously are testing assumptions and changing your beliefs, recognizing that you have a particular perspective on the world and that that perspective may inhibit solutions rather than yield them. Top-down refinement is another habit of experts in problem solving. It's about looking at the bigger picture. There are also specific strategies you can undertake to help conceptualize problems in order to solve them. So again, from the world of puzzles and riddles, uh, the Monty Hall problem, um, I'll, I'll let you look that up in your own time, I won't go into it here, but it's a problem that asks you to start quite small. And actually the answer isn't obvious unless you come at it big. Um, so as opposed to three things, which is in the original Monty Hall problem, if you expand that to a hundred things, it becomes a lot easier to understand. The Blue Eyes Riddle, um, which I'll, I'll come on to a little bit later, uh, is a logic puzzle which starts with, um, which starts big with a hundred things. And that could be kind of quite difficult to conceptualize. But if you look at it from the perspective of starting small and start with one thing, then it becomes a lot easier to conceptualize and you can kind of gradually build up two things, three things and so on. Avoiding rabbit holes is an important one. So, you know, rabbit holes, particularly in security, we end up down a lot of them, um, particularly for those in technical roles. Um, rabbit holes can be good. They're not necessarily bad. They can lead you to the acquisition of very niche and important and otherwise obscure learning um, that can be very good. The issue is when it 
distract you from the end goal and when you end up down a rabbit hole and can't remember how you got there or how to get out so that's just a, a conscious thing you have to be kind of you have to be conscious of it when you end up down a rabbit hole you have to remember why you went down there in the first place and how to get back out self-explanation or rubber ducky debugging so anyone in development um, will perhaps be familiar with the concept of rubber ducky debugging you uh, you know when you're having a shower or having a bath you explain the problem to an inanimate object like a rubber duck and that helps you to uh, hopefully make some breakthroughs in the problem solving process by explaining the problem to yourself as if you're explaining it to someone else spontaneous thought I mentioned a little bit earlier this is about letting uh, the problem sort of wash over you and not thinking about it consciously um, although the evidence suggests that your brain will, uh, at least part of your brain, will continue working on that problem um, unconsciously. And then finally, uh, awareness of various biases, so including the ones, the six ones that I went through earlier, but also just recognizing in general that we see the world or tend to see the world through dominant constructs. This means that we have a particular worldview which we prefer and dominant constructs tend to inhib inhibit solutions um, whereas alternate constructs by recognizing that there are other worldviews or other ways to see the world can actually uh, lead to solutions uh, and to problem solving okay so i'm just going to cover problem solving in infosec now so infosec problem solving problems in, in uh, security tend to be what are called knowledge rich problems that is that they require knowledge outside of the problem itself whether that's technical knowledge policy knowledge um, experience in a particular thing whatever it happens to be and they can also be quite ill-defined so they may not have concrete boundaries there may not be um, a sort of concrete limit on the problem area or the problem space a variety of people undertake problems in security coming from a variety of backgrounds and levels of experience from experts through to pre-novices so people who are completely new to the field and there are many schemas depending on, on which particular part of security you work in i'm sure you could think of hundreds of examples of problems in infosec both technical and non-technical uh, i just wanted to talk about one uh, very briefly uh, which I think illustrates the process pretty well. So it's a talk from uh, DEF CON 16 by Matty Aharoni um, of the offensive security team. And it's talking about a particular exploit that was developed for a particular vulnerability. And whilst developing that exploit, they experienced multiple obstacles, multiple setbacks, which required lateral thinking um, and innovation and awareness of biases and that sort of thing. So really good example, it's on YouTube. Uh, and generally speaking, the same strategies apply for uh, improvement when it comes to problem solving, for problem solving in security, as they do for problem solving generally. A couple of other things that might assist with problem solving in security. The first is problem isomorphs. So this is essentially a problem which um, or two problems which have the same underlying requirements and the same underlying demands but may have a slightly different cover story so the actual problem space remains the same on that note incomplete knowledge transfer may be useful so uh, knowledge transfer is the um, use of experience and awareness and knowledge from one domain to another it very rarely happens completely uh, if at all but certainly it can it happens incompletely all the time which is why it's important i think to have a diversity in background and expertise in security um, for people to come from multidisciplinary backgrounds because many people will be able to apply that knowledge transfer and come up with a solution and that can be useful for applying uh, puzzles and riddles and learning from those to real world situations and then there's problem solving by analogy so um, if you particularly if you work in a technical role you'll be familiar with analogies and using them to explain various technical concepts to less technical audiences but it can also help with problem solving as well the research does suggest that people need to be explicitly told of what that uh, told what that analogy is um, in order to try and make it relate to the problem um, but certainly with things like CTFs 
um, there is uh, an element of problem solving by analogy there. So I mentioned CTFs. Um, I'm now going to talk about our puzzle program, which I think is kind of an alternative way to uh, to address problem solving uh, in security. So at PwC, we have about 300 staff comprising uh, people from deep technical disciplines like pen testing, incident response, through to architecture specialists, core consultants, sector specific consultants, and people in support policy and leadership roles as well. So a really varied mix of backgrounds and technical knowledge. And uh, just looking at this graphic here, this represents people's undergraduate degrees in our practice. So you can see obviously computer science comes out on top as you'd expect, but a whole host of qualifications in other sciences, in arts and humanities, in language and other subjects as well. So the first puzzle began in early 2018 with me trolling a colleague with a puzzle. You can find a version of it um, at that link. And it's supposed to be one of the hardest logic puzzles um, ever. Um, since then, there've been about 40 puzzles. Most of them uh, I've designed from scratch, although some of them have been adapted from existing puzzles. And they tend to cover these four categories, wordplay or cryptic puzzles, logic puzzles, maths and probability, and technical challenges, so similar to CTFs or CTFs. Some of them are themed, some of them are abstract, some of them are independent, some of them are, are multi-stage, so you need the answers from a previous stage to get to the next stage. And the majority of them are designed to be solved within two or three days, although some uh, take a little bit longer. And the perfect puzzle, ideally, um, has some sort of interesting story or premise behind it, something that draws people in. Ideally, it has very little exposition. You don't really want paragraphs of explanation of the background of the puzzle. You may have a hidden trapdoor function. This is optional, but uh, an alternative way to get to the solution, which might rely on a particular, uh, particularly lateral piece of thinking um, or a particular piece of knowledge. You can have red herrings and Easter eggs um, really depends on your preference. I like putting them in. I have a colleague who designs escape rooms who uh, detests red herrings, but it really depends on your preference. Some of the most interesting puzzles actually are something completely unconnected to the premise of the puzzle itself. They can be uh, really fascinating ones. But ideally a puzzle always has its own internal logic. The answer should be obtainable from the question itself. And ideally, other than maybe the use of a search engine for a quick query, you shouldn't need any specialist knowledge beyond the premise itself either. So a very quick example of a puzzle that we've run, I won't read this whole thing out, but essentially you're trying to find someone's birthday from various clues. The crucial clue here is square eight to get the month and the day. Add another square to that and it's obvious. And what you're being asked is, what is the date of birth? What's the birthday? And where does my friend live? And the location of where my friend lives is an example of something seemingly unconnected to the premise of the puzzle. So on reading that puzzle, I'm playing on various assumptions, I'm giving various clues. So an assumption is that the date of birth is gonna be a normal date, i.e. it's gonna have a maximum of 31 for the day, a maximum of 12 for the month. I've mentioned that it's an old school friend of mine. Obviously I am over 18, so the person is gonna be over 18 and having a beer at a bar. So at least in the UK, you would be kind of over 18 for that. Um, squaring eight to get the month and day, that's 64. So we're probably talking about either the 6th of April or the 4th of June. And then the puzzle says, add another square and it should be obvious. And this is where the kind of lateral thinking comes in and challenging assumptions because the square in this case is not a mathematical term. The answer to the puzzle is the 35th of May, 1989, which in itself isn't a valid date, but in China it's used to refer to the 4th of June, 1989, which was the date of the Tiananmen Square protests. And that date, the 35th of May, fulfills all of the conditions around the prime factors, that the day minus the month equals the age at next birthday, or at least it did in 2019. Adding a square in this case means a square as in a location. So if you Google June 4th square, you will get stuff about the 4th of June, 1989. Another example, this is one of my favorite ones. So this was a three part puzzle to give the location of a team event day, which was being held off site. 
So there were three parts. Uh, parts one and two were released at the same time, and then part three afterwards. And you could use the answers from parts one and two together with the answer from part three to get the location of this site, but you could also just use part three. So part one was a WAV file of the song Never Gonna Give You Up. So a lot of people were looking into Rick Astley's biography, trying to get clues as to the location from that. But actually, uh, if you looked at the WAV file in a spectrogram and um, analyzed that, you came up with this written riddle. And the answer to that riddle is the letter U. So a U bow, a U bend, a U is a horseshoe shape, uh, a U, U is not the first person, it's second person, and sounds like a tree, a U tree. Part two was an image um, which contained least significant bit steganography. If you analyze that to retrieve um, the hidden message, you got this clue here. Um, the use of a search engine together with reverse image searching of that image would give you the answer. So it's 5446. The clue says to add one, so it's 5546. And then part three was a short video of the chess scene in 2001 A Space Odyssey where one of the astronauts, I can't remember which one, is playing chess with Hal. An alphanumeric string appeared at the end of that video and there was obvious Morse code beeps over the scene itself. Now if you decode those Morse beeps, you get the message, not going to be that easy. But again, if you look at it in a spectrogram, there's ultrasonic Morse code which spells out lichess or lichess.org. The video brightness also flashed in Morse code to give pretty much the same clue. And the kind of setup message um, where I kind of announced the puzzle, if you look at the periods and hyphens within that message, they also spell out Morse code for that. Um, so lightchess.org is a, a chess website. You can load up chess games. Um, if you went to uh, lightchess.org plus the alphanumeric string shown on the video, you got taken to this chess game. That's a form of chess steganography. If you decode that, you get this, this message, which is uh, another alphanumeric string, and then uh, read the Slack message again carefully. If you again went back to the announcement of the puzzle, the first letter of each, each sentence spells out pastebin. If you do pastebin plus the string, you get this riddle here. Uh, and in particular, pay attention to the last line with hex as key. So that's a pun on ASCII. If you convert everything to, that's already ASCII to hex and everything that is hex to ASCII, you end up with uh, 0 times 75 UF or a UK postcode 0x75 UF, which was the postcode of the away day. There was a way to solve it just through that riddle itself, through that written riddle. So if you solved each line of that, you would be able to get some search terms which you could put into a search engine and that would also give you the location as well. So I've got some stats on the kind of puzzles that we run and how many we run. So uh, the overwhelming majority of puzzles to date have been uh, logic puzzles, but also quite a few wordplay and tech puzzles and then maths uh, kind of in fourth place there. The most successful category has been uh, maths puzzles, then tech, then wordplay and then logic. The graph on the left illustrates answers over time, so the dark red line is correct answers over time and the paler red line is incorrect answers. So um, probably not quite enough data to make inferences there properly, but you can see kind of what the, the correct answers have gone up over time, the incorrect answers have gone down certainly kind of in the last year or so. Uh, the graph on the right shows puzzle engagement over time, so that has gone up over time. There have been peaks and troughs as people are, are busy or, or kind of more or less interested in puzzles or depending on what kind of organizational activity the puzzles are tied to but overall the engagement has gone up over time um, tech puzzles have had the most engagement as you might expect that being a, a cyber security bu but then wordplay has the second most so the second most kind of popular time to solve is a little bit more difficult um, just because that tends to be a function of the puzzle difficulty which fluctuates from puzzle to puzzle depending on what type it is and who's doing it. So it's not really a reliable indicator, but it's interesting. The record we have for the quickest puzzle ever solved was something like four minutes. Um, and the uh, one that's taken the longest is uh, just under two days. So I just wanted to um, show you some unexpected or amusing kind of answers we've had. Um, this was in relation to the birthday puzzle I took you through earlier. Um, this was someone who went to extreme lengths with the, the Morse code video to try and find the uh, differences in the um, frame brightness. 
and uh, other clues like that. A very common response, uh, spe uh, specifically with the kind of lateral thinking, logical puzzles, uh, people kind of working together and supporting each other and keeping each other going throughout solving these. And then uh, my favorite one, this is from um, one of the partners of our business unit, who I think kind of pretty much summed up his frustration with me with, with some of these puzzles. Um, and then there are also people, of course, when you're looking at problem solving, who just go straight ahead and cut the Gordian knot into two rather than trying to untie it. And uh, there's one particular person in our business unit who does that. I just wanted to highlight some of his replies. Um, so the fact that he kind of crashes a bulldozer right through my puzzles. Uh, this was for the away day one. So people weren't told the location of the away day until the puzzle had been solved. He decided it would be easier to just wait. Um, this was a logic puzzle around guessing the colors of hats. This was a knights and knave puzzle around which door to go through. So one door leads to freedom. The other leads to a room full of hungry tigers. Um, and I uh, particularly liked that second sentence of that response. So I did a quick straw poll of people who've participated in the puzzles uh, over the last two years, pretty small sample, um, but just to get an idea of, of kind of how they feel about them in terms of difficulty and the benefits. So you can see most people estimate that the difficulties are, are hard to fairly hard. Um, most people love them or really enjoy them. And there's also quite a lot of collaboration. So only a small percentage of people from this dip sample actually never collaborate at all on puzzles. Most people do it at least occasionally and some people do it frequently as well. People on the whole uh, agree that the puzzles have contributed to culture and to collaboration and cooperation. They've helped to develop problem solving skills. Most people would like to do more puzzles in the future. And um, most people agree that problem solving is especially important in cybersecurity. Again, most people agreeing that it is important to try to strengthen problem solving abilities. More of a mixed opinion for whether it's a good idea to try to measure problem solving ability. Um, you could say kind of, a, you know, it's a, it's a tie there between people who are neutral about it and people who either agree or strongly agree. But certainly some people disagree with that. The puzzles should be job specific, e.g. CTFs. Again, a mixed opinion on that. Some people agreeing, some strongly disagreeing, some disagreeing. Um, and finally, doing puzzles increases my problem solving capability and or changes my perspective and thinking. So some people remain neutral on that, but the majority of people agreeing with it. And I also just wanted to highlight some individual feedback, um, some anonymous feedback on, on the benefits of this for people's day-to-day -day role. So people saying it's uh, a good illustration of the greater than the sum of parts concept helps them to look at the larger picture when they're solving problems used in my day-to-day -day role, a correlation between puzzle solving um, at work and in life, keeping problem skills, uh, problem solving skills sharp and uh, being helpful for a range of situations, reading between the lines, thinking beyond what could be obvious and showing the application of a cyber concept uh, in practice. I also asked people what they thought were important attributes for problem solving. Open mind, lateral thinking, thinking outside the box, uh, deliberation I think is an important one, thinking holistically about a problem. And crucially, I think this one really struck home with me is being able to let go of a chain of thinking um, if it's not working or if you realize that it's biased or ineffective. Assimilating new information, structuring your thoughts and prioritizing issues, Again, seeing the bigger picture. Curiosity and stubbornness. I think um, many people in security can relate to those two attributes. Um, dividing and conquering the problem to, to um, uh, come up with accurate sub-problems. So a good illustration there of sub-goaling, of uh, breaking the problem down into achievable parts. So I wanted to cover a quick case study of where myself and a colleague used this on a piece of research. So a couple of years ago, um, myself and someone else were working on a project called Sandgrox, which was coming up uh, with various ways for our red teaming malware to detect and evade sandboxes on targeted hosts. And to do this, we had to do a number of the things I've talked about in this presentation. We had to think laterally, 
think of novel forms of detection. So going beyond CPU red pills and things like that to thinking about environmental factors, you know, um, what programs were installed, how many recent documents are there, that sort of thing. Challenging our own assumptions about what a sandbox can and can't detect. Subgoaling, so testing if something is technically feasible before actually testing if it actually contributes to the end state. Avoiding rabbit holes was a key one. We ended up down a few rabbit holes, but crucially we were able to, to kind of find our way back out of them. Spontaneous thought played quite a big part in this project, letting the problem kind of wash over us for a few days and then coming back to it. Avoiding bias, particularly in this case, self-serving bias. So thinking we were making logical or rational decisions when sometimes we weren't. And then finally, problem isomorphs. So there are a lot of related problems in security, which helped us with this project human computer interaction, bot detection, and antivirus evasion specifically, um, but also some other areas as well. So if you want to start your own puzzle program, um, I would highly recommend you do it. You could do a pilot to start with just to see how it goes. And if you want to do that, I would strongly recommend starting off with pre-existing puzzles that you can find um, on these resources here, just because creating puzzles from scratch uh, once you're starting off, it's very time consuming. So the, the away day puzzle that I mentioned, the three-parter, that took something like 14 hours to come up with and to actually implement. Some good resources for finding puzzles or getting tips on, on puzzle creation um, is Puzzling Stack Exchange. The TED-Ed YouTube channel has a number of riddles and puzzles on it. You can always find good cryptic crosswords in newspapers. And then of course in security there, there are CTFs, there's DEF CON challenges, badge challenges and things like that. Lessons that I've learned from doing this for two years, it's really important to mix up the formats and the genres to broaden appeal and keep people interested. Really important to measure engagement and statistics as you go. It can be quite difficult to try and do that retrospectively. So ideally you release the puzzles or riddles on some sort of platform where you can at least approximate, approximate um, engagement, measures of engagement. Linking to other organizational activity really helps. So if you have team events, that sort of thing, linking a puzzle with the puzzles with those can help with engagement. Encouraging collaboration, whether that's mandating that people have to do them in teams or encouraging teamwork or designing the puzzles specifically so that, um, you know, maybe some of it can be solved by a pen tester, but actually to solve the next bit, they're going to have to go and speak to someone in threat intelligence or incident response or someone um, on an architecture team or something like that. Incentives and prizes obviously can help. And crucially, I think, encouraging inclusivity. So not alienating would-be participants by making it all technical or making it all about strategy, for example. Okay, so just to sum up, um, problem solving is a skill. And like any skill, it can be strengthened and there are specific processes which underpin it. There are also specific strategies for improving it. It's not just a case of do it more often, although that does help, but there are specific things you can do to uh, strengthen problem solving ability. Also worth noting that there are specific risks and biases associated with problem solving and that really they need to be recognized before you can improve. Puzzles and riddles are a great way to develop problem solving skills. It's not necessarily an isolated case of it just makes you better at puzzles or riddles it gives you skills and abilities which you can then apply to larger problems and day-to-day -day problems, as well as contributing to culture and engagement. The design and type of puzzle is really important and it does need some thought before you go ahead and release it. So hopefully I'm gonna create at some point a repository of some of the puzzles I've done um, at my workplace. I would love it if people would add theirs um, once that's up and running. Plus, statistics around engagement would be really helpful, critiques, analyses, that kind of thing. Um, there is certainly a gap in the research on the psychology of security-related problem solving. There has been research previously on problem solving in the context of software development and programming, but not much on security-related problem solving. So that, I think, would be a really interesting topic. I'm hoping to do some, some more work on that, and I hope other people do as well. And lastly, don't forget to have a crack at the crossword if you if you haven't started it yet. So the link is thedarkartlab.com slash crossword20. And then either email me um, your answers by the 13th of August at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time or DM them on Twitter um, or however you want to get them to me. 
So lots of references here. Uh, if you want to have a look at these uh, over the summer for some for some reading, um, so quite a few references there. And finally, my contact details. You can get me on Twitter at darkartlab, or you can email me matt.wixi at pwc.com. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for attending. I really hope it's been useful and interesting. And uh, future me is now going to take some questions. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much for attending the talk and I hope you found it interesting. Uh, I'm pretty short of time, so rather than taking any questions live, I'll answer any that come up on the chat in the next few minutes. Or if you want to get in touch at any time to discuss the talk, my email address is matt.wixie at pwc.com and my Twitter account is at darkartlab. I'll be looking to set up that puzzle repository I mentioned in the next few weeks and I'll announce that on Twitter, so keep an eye out for that if you're interested. I'll also announce the Crossword winner there next week as well. Thanks again and hope you all have a great conference.